Hello everyone, my name is Jimena Aguilar Vega. I'm from the University of Stirling. Welcome to the Cryosphere Pavilion and this event on limits of adaptation. I want to welcome also those of you watching virtually, including at the Cryosphere Pavilion in Stockholm and Geneva, and those watching online. The first person I would like to, to introduce is Julie Brigham Gretti from the University of Massachusetts. Please, Julie. Thank you very much. It's my pleasure to, um, can you hear me? Okay. It's my pleasure to talk to you about just some perspectives on the limits to ad adaptation. Um, we like to think we can adjust to anything, but we do probably face um, some limits. And if, and if a lot of what the reasons are outlined in this report, if you haven't seen it, that, it, that come out of this pavilion. I, I do paleoclimate science. I study shorelines and I'm interested in how uh, the Arctic has changed over time. And so we can look at previous ex natural experiments in Earth history, particularly those previous warm periods caused by reasons not related necessarily to CO2. We can look at how sea level has changed. And we know that from the paleoclimate record that if temperatures reach um, one degree, we're already there, we know that we're on the road to something like the last interglacial when sea level was around six to nine meters above present. So we're already on that trajectory, even under the uh, present scenario. At one and a half degrees, we're starting to head into a world uh, that mimics where we were at about 400,000 years ago in stage 11 with much higher sea levels and sea level only gets higher. So particularly as we get into two to three degrees uh, warmer, we're really approaching uh, a world like the Pliocene three million years ago when we actually had PCO2 uh, in the re in above 400 parts per mil. So we're already in a Pliocene atmosphere right now. And so we've got to reverse that as we all know. And it only gets worse. So the question is not how fast, but how much, and how can we change it? So this figure kind of shows that, um, that a story that I just told you on the left is where we were in pre-industrial and on the left hand axis is the uh, PCO2 and on the bottom are these different interglacial scenarios with sea level. The little pie charts give you an estimate of what we think may have melted um, to, to account for this and we're still working on, scientific community is still working on trying to narrow this uh, down. But certainly I think the, the important point is that we are um, already at 400 parts per mil, very much like the Pliocene scenario. And as I'll talk about later today, uh, the estimates uh, currently for the Pliocene are anywhere from 12 to 20 meters above present sea level, which could be uh, in uh, several thousand years. But certainly implies uh, rapid sea level changes uh, are underway. So. We know that the Greenland ice sheet is losing mass. And you're gonna hear this several times today if you stick around. We know that the Greenland ice sheet is melting quite quickly and losing mass. And this beautiful animation shows you um, the areas of Greenland, particularly uh, Southern Greenland, but a lot of the West Slope that is losing ice mass uh, relatively quickly. And just recently, um, of course, NASA has summarized a lot of the uh, amount of ice that's being lost on an annual basis. And we have projections about what the ice sheet might look like even by 2300, which isn't that really that far away. And we know that West, the Antarctic ice sheet, we're gonna hear a lot about that today. We heard a lot about it already from the Leeds group this morning about the instabilities with ice shelves and whether are not these ice shelves, if they radically collapse, we could see rapid changes in sea level. And so this has really important policy um, factors, which, and this SROC report coming out in 2019, getting ready for Glasgow is really about this, the role of policy in deciding the trajectory we're on. I'm preaching to the choir here about this factor, but we all understand 
there are serious consequences, which um, a lot of the public just doesn't quite understand. Another factor that's, that's impacting um, adaptation uh, is sea level rise and coastal erosion. There are many pavilions here today from countries all over the world that are facing coastal erosion and sea level rise. I'm gonna highlight just a few things about particularly the Arctic region where I work. Many of, much of the Arctic is of course surrounded by permafrost. The coastal regions contain frozen ice and that frozen ice is very vulnerable to thermal warming and therefore rapid, rapid collapse uh, in the permafrost. Around the Arctic, various science pieces of the science community, various members of the science community have been documenting the rates of retreat. And here, the larger the circle here, the more rapid the retreat in meters per year. And you can see that some areas are in the even up to eight meters per year in erosion, uh, particularly you can see along the coast of Canada and the United States, but also throughout many parts of the Arctic, we're losing uh, ground partly because of this frozen state. This frozen material contains a lot of methane. We haven't heard a lot uh, um, in the last couple of days about the permafrost and the, and the methane release. So as these co cliffs collapse, we're uh, adding more organic matter uh, into the oceans, but also into the atmosphere as these uh, release. So a lot of communities in the Arctic regions, while they may seem remote to many of us, they are not. These indigenous people who live in coastal regions are really facing um, a big challenge. Here is an example from just this summer where just off the Kuskokwim Delta, the Yukon Kuskokwim Delta, during a king tide, so a full, full moon, new moon, um, sea level was so high that it flooded many villages. And part of the reason is sea levels coming up, but the other thing is the permafrost is being lost and their villages are sinking centimeters per year in some cases. So they wanna know, a person living in this village might say, I've got a five-year-old daughter can she live in this village when she's 30? Can she raise her family here? That's the questions we're being asked. These are the things that they're, being, they're facing. Nobody wants to move from where they grew up. It's an emotional thing to do that and to move a whole community. And there are many communities, in particularly in Alaska, um, our big petroleum state of Alaska has 30 some villages or, uh, that need to be moved. And only a few of these villages are actually have any kind of managed retreat underway. And so it's, it's a real crisis for many of these uh, remote villages who need to move together as a tribe, as a clan, as a group. So I really like this pro uh, proverb. If we don't change the direction we're heading, we're gonna end up where we're going, which is kind of business as usual. And I want to come back to my own country, the United States. Estimates are that if we look at the Gulf Coast, Florida, and surrounding states, that in the coming decades, as many as 6 million people or more are going to be affected. They're going to have to move. There has to be managed retreat from these coastlines. Nobody's thinking about this. I just show this because I'm actually headed to the American Geophysical Union meeting in, in next month, and it's being held in New Orleans. This is the shoreline today. This is one meter. Now remember, New Orleans is a huge coastal port. We, we transport um, goods in and out of uh, New Orleans all the time, and, and we have also all of uh, the petroleum industries are not gonna be protected. This is one meter of sea level change. And you can imagine what happens in a storm. You've heard about that on the news. This is um, two and a half meters. So these low lying areas um, are very vulnerable to change. No one is starting locally, cities and, and, and communities are talking about what they need to do for managed retreat. But we need to do the thinking about this on a bigger scale, get in front of it um, because um, 
a lot of people are in harm's way and we need to deal with this. I'm a physical scientist, but we really need to deal with the social science of what's in our hearts and our guts about moving whole communities. We also have a lot of infrastructure here. And it's astounding to me that places like, even in, in Florida, they're still planning to build high-rise buildings. This is a, a picture I took out of an airplane flight magazine back when we had them before COVID. Um, why would you have a 30-year mortgage on a building that's at sea level? I mean, just think about that. So we have some big decisions in working with businesses and in terms of adaptation. So this is my last slide. Um, this is a paper that came out a couple of years ago um, talking about how you deal with the policies of risk to communities, whether they accept them or not, the social benefits, what benefits the community, what benefits the larger society, what are the cost benefit ratios of moving and managing retreat, and where's the political will? And where we want to be is in that upper right hand corner where there's mutual agreement about benefits to society, benefits to community, and good cost benefit ratio and political will. Unfortunately, in in many places, as this paper outlines, we're in these other boxes where the, the we do not have mutual agreement. So I think this is a real big challenge. Um, uh, and, and we need to work together with social scientists as well as physical scientists to meet that need. Thank you very much, and I'll turn it on to the next speaker. Thank you. So, I will give you a perspective here from the world of glaciers and focus on disappearing glaciers in the world. Glaciers have lost, retreated, and thinned dramatically during the last decades. Here an example from Alaska, an example from Argentina. Um, and what is really new, or not new, but many glaciers have, def have, uh, have disappeared. They're completely gone. And just you know, some of them, just within a few years. Here an example from Switzerland. Uh, here, another example from the trop tropics, Chakaltaya Glacier is gone. Um, what about the future? When you look at the futures, um, this is here a scenario, a high emission scenario, a low emission scenario. It makes a big difference which scenario we are on. For the high emission scenario, this is the largest glacier in Europe is projected to disappear. Whereas for low emission scenario, um, maybe half of the, uh, the volume or mass is still there. Um, here, what you see is the global glacier change by 2100 per degree global warming above in, uh, pre-industrial. And so what you see is with every degree warming, more mass is lost, more area is lost, sea level is higher. And what I really want to focus you on is the number of glaciers that are disappearing. We have uh, 200,000 glaciers in the world outside the ice sheets. And for a high emission scenario here, six degrees warming, um, almost 100% are gone. So many, many glaciers are literally completely disappearing. And it's sort of a linear um, increase depending on the warming. This is the same type of picture or graph for different regions. So what you see is how much mass is remaining. One is here 100% right now. How much is remaining for every degree global warming above pre-industrial? And in all of these figures, you, um, uh, graphs, you see um, it's sort of a linear trend. The higher the warming, the less mass is remaining. And in particular, I want to draw your attention here to these regions here, Western Canada, uh, parts in, in, in Asia, Scandinavia, Central Europe, low latitudes. We're even at a, with a 1.5 degree warming, um, there's basically very, very little left at the end of the century. So there's, depending where you are here, it's like 20, 10%, 30% left, even with 1.5 degrees warming. And, and then in some regions, like the low latitudes here, are, it is a huge difference if it's 1.5 degrees or 2 degrees. It's a really a steep decline here. 
And when you go to three, four, five, six degrees, it doesn't matter anymore. There's no, not very sensitive, and that is because they are gone. So what you see here is again glacier mass that really remain, but now it are uh, uh, more uh, more local perspective here for every grid cell in the world for the different regions. Blue means a lot of ice is left over by the end of the century. Red, the redder it is, the less is left over. And I want to draw your attention to the black circles. That is glaciers, regions, or uh, sub-regions that are completely uh, ice-free by the end of the century here for 1.5 degrees. So even for 1.5 degrees, you see here many sub-regions in these regions are completely ice-free. And the higher the temperature, more regions uh, join that club here with having sub-regions that are completely ice-free, four degrees, five degrees. And so a lot of ice is still left over in the polar regions, but where people live, where there's livelihoods, that's the regions where uh, many, many glaciers are literally disappearing and very, very uh, little ice left between like maybe 10, 20% of ice is left in these regions. The consequences, I just want to show an example is, especially in these regions with these smaller glaciers, that mass loss affects runoff. Typically, because of more melt, you have first more, first you have more runoff, but then as the glacier retreats, the runoff goes down and you have a tipping point here, a turning point, which is called peak water. And so, of course, for water resources management, it's in order for agriculture, for hydropower, it's very important. Is the runoff from the glaciers increasing or is it decreasing? So this turning point when that happens is, is crucial to know. And what you see here is a global study um, for each of these grid cells calculated when is runoff increasing or decreasing from the glaciers. And what you see is, in, especially in these regions I was talking about earlier, that have little ice here, Central Europe or South America, uh, uh, North America, except for Alaska, um, the peak water, that's the blue, uh, when it's red, has already been reached or is reached very, very, very soon. Whereas the regions here with blue, like here in, in, in Alaska, so peak water is going to be reached later. But that's, of course, crucial information for water resources management, agriculture, and water, um, any water resources uh, issues. Um, here's also just an example from high mountain Asia, where the water from the mountains matters a lot. And what I want to emphasize is here that there's large differences depending on the trajectory, the emission pathway, but also very, very large uh, local differences, regional differences, uh, where, where you can see like peak water is reached very late, the blue color, and in some regions, just neighboring valleys, it has already been reached. Um, not only the total amount is important, but what is also important is the seasonal variation. How are the, is the seasonal runoff changing? That's, of course, very important for agriculture. And what is shown here is 56 large river basins that have, oh, some of them have only like 2% glaciers. It's one of the large river basins in the world. And you see the runoff changes for the summer months. And when you see blue means there's more water. When you see red, there's less water under two emission scenarios. And what you really see is like in the beginning of the season in June here in, in Europe, North America or Asia, there's a lot more water because the melting starts earlier. But in August or um, in, in the middle of the summer, there's a lot less water. So even though the total amount of water might be the same, the seasonality can change dramatically um, in, in, these, in these basins, which of course has in, in, in importance for agriculture. So just want to wrap up here with some key messages. Many glaciers will disappear, um, but the glacier decline can be slowed by limiting warming. It's really each increment of uh, temperature increase matters and makes a huge difference. And the impacts, there's many, many impacts. I just focused a little bit on the water resources, but important is to know there's many different impacts and the impacts vary regionally and they're very on very small scales. And that means also then for adaptation measures that they really need to be adjusted locally depending on the impact in the particular region where you are. Thank you very much.
Thank you so much, Regine. Our next speaker is Georg Casa. So good morning and thank you very much. Uh, I'm without slides and there is a good reason for that. My name is Georg Casa. I'm a glaciologist. Uh, mainly working or having worked on tropical glaciers, and it sounds a little bit strange that I'm talking about uh, adaptation limits, but I, I am still too also a review editor to two chapters of working group two of the presently prepared uh, IPCC report. And in the entire uh, working group two report on adaptation, on vulnerabilities, the limits of adaptation are a big issue. And now I feel uncomfortable for the reason that usually I'm the person to say, to push and say, uh, we have no time to wait. We have no time to, 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 to discuss about what is needed to be done. We should start this evening already in ACT. And I tell that already since three years. So the evenings have passed and all have gone. Or the next mornings. But this time I have to ask you for a bit of a patience and that is because uh, the working group two report with all its different chapters including a cross chapter paper on mountains which is the very first time that something like that is uh, being dealt with particularly in the IPCC that is in its final uh, draft for the governmental uh, review process and by uh, uh, by the the, uh, the the contract with the IPCC governments, this is all the 196 uh, uh, national governments. The summary for policymakers has to be adopted, and the adoption, adoption process, adoption process uh, is being held mid of February 2000, uh, 2022. So we have to wait with these results. I can just tell you that there are plenty of results. There are beautiful results in, and I can just very briefly give you an overview what the kind of where the tendency of these results is going. And I concentrate only on the mountain, this, uh, this cross chapter paper on mountains. Although there had been people around here the last days which had the better legacy to talk about. As a review editor, I know basically what is in there without telling too much details, going uh, beyond my, my uh, possibility. So first of all, uh, we know that uh, adaptation measures so far, th there is a lot of, of increasing number of uh, publications uh, and research out. So almost daily new publications are coming up and they have assessed hundreds and hundreds of papers which uh, are all a bit incremental. There is nothing which gives a, a proper overview. So this assessment will be the first one which gives a, a very good overview. And uh, one can say that so far, and this is just a very general statement, so far the main uh, adaptation measures have been taken by smallholders in agriculture. Uh, by uh, in, uh, in agriculture and pastoralism, by small households. And yesterday we have heard that this is mainly done by females. Yesterday was the gender day and we had a interest, very interesting discussion here. So it's basically carried out by females. Can I continue? You will hear, but I can't hear anything. Okay, so uh, there is very little on the level of uh, private sectors and on the level of uh, or the, 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 the sectors of sanitation health. So those that could really do something on a bigger scale there is little to be seen. On the other side, it is these long-term perspectives like healthcare, like sanitation, where these local small 
uh, stakeholders, they, they cannot do very much. And it is basically, as I said, the females, because the male have all left for in many areas of the, of the world, not everywhere. But in many areas, they have left for work conditions, for work uh, uh, economic reasons. And so they, they are looking for money while the, the females are taking care of the small fields and the, and the animals. You, you know all that. I'm not telling you anything new. Uh, the point is that, that mountains are extremely complex in all ways. And if you just look at the atmospheric physics or physicists, they don't talk about mountains anymore. They talk about complex terrain. They do meteorology on complex terrain, which is uh, just, just showing how complex the entire thing is. And that has impacts on how people have, uh, have uh, adapted to some areas, how they are taking adaption, measure, adaption measurements, how the risks are increasing. And at that also created or is overlaid by a complexity of uh, global scale diversity of economic situations, governance situations. And, and there are two, uh, two uh, obstacles, two major obstacles towards adaptation. One is, of course, these hard uh, obstacles, these hard uh, uh, limits of adaptation, and this is the uh, biophysical adaptations. If the mountain falls down, you cannot adapt anymore, just in, in very hard words. But the other one is the soft one, and these soft ones, this is governance and the economics and the social cultural issues, and they are so slow that there is only this incremental adaptation measures taken by small communities and nothing is transitional or sustainable. So there is a, a, a very big challenge uh, being ahead. Not in every mountain region the same. If you compare the Alps with, uh, with the Himalayas, it's totally different. And if you then go to the Andes, there is a totally different situation. And I would just end with two statements. One is modifying Regine's statement that every degree counts or every increment. She has shifted from degrees to increments. I would say every tenth of degree pushes us further toward uh, a limit of adaptation. So it's changing every day and we are getting every day into more complicated situations. And the other statement is something I take from from uh, Pema Gyamcho, the director of Isimod, who yesterday has, has put it in such a nice way. And he said it's running away or migration, which nobody likes to talk about, but it's running away. The people from the mountains run down the, the valleys because uh, escaping from gloves, from uh, rock falls, from avalanches and so on. The people from the lowlands, they escape from... from uh, uh, heat waves, they escape from, from storm surges and they run up. And in the middle, there is something which is just uh, already occupied too much. And, and that is something which is uh, putting us into real limits of adaptation. So let me stop with that and uh, remind you that the main report about that with many, many details and interesting details is coming out by mid-February uh, end of February 2022. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Georg, for this holistic overview. Our next speaker is Mark Sures. Please, Mark. Uh, hello, everyone. I uh, appreciate your being here. Um, We've heard a lot about ice sheets and sea level rise and glaciers and sea level rise and the many impacts. Um, but I want to focus on something a little different here. Uh, most of my research through the years has focused on the Arctic region. And a lot of that's been on the sort of the physics of change, what's happening to the ice cover. But increasingly, I've been drawn into uh, issues of uh, the impacts of what's happening in the Arctic. And I want to talk a bit about the impacts of Arctic rain on snow events. We sometimes forget that the people who are really on the front line, some of the people on the very much on the front lines of experienced climate change are those residents of the Arctic themselves. 
Um, what am I talking about, about these rain on snow events? I'm trying to put it in a little picture here that we have a moist air mass that moves into an Arctic region where there's an existing snow cover. Now, these are typically during autumn or maybe early spring, typically autumn. And uh, so instead of snow, you get rain that falls on the existing snow cover. And then it gets cold after that. You know, the storm goes through, cold front comes through. And uh, you leave an icy crust on the snow. And uh, that has many, many effects. Uh, it can impact, for example, polar bear and seal denning, slush avalanches, things like that. But one of the biggest impacts is on ungulates, like reindeer okay, or caribou, which are essentially the same species, uh, uh, muskox, for example. And there have been a number of recorded events of, for example, 30, 40, 50,000 uh, reindeer uh, dying. Uh, over fairly quickly or extended period over a year because of these rain on snow events. And the reason for this is this icy crust, which can prevent foraging. And so the impacts of this can be quick over a matter of weeks if they can't forage, or they can actually extend over a number of years through various generations. Uh, for example, a lot of calf mortality and things like that. Here's just an example of a, of a situation where there were actually two rain on snow events, each of them leaving an icy crust. Uh, so here you see some uh, reindeer right here. Reindeer and caribou are essentially the same species. Uh, reindeer, of course, are semi-domesticated, and they have some morphological differences because of that, but they're essentially the same species. So, you know, here's what I'm talking about is, is mortality, and it can be massive sometimes, uh, 30, 40, 50,000 at a time. Uh, so other species, for example, there was an event on Banks Island uh, some time ago where something like 20,000 muskox uh, uh, were uh, starved because of such an event. And uh, where the, uh, the real concern is, is the people of the north who depend on the reindeer, reindeer herders, like the Nets reindeer herders, right? who their entire culture is built around or focused around reindeer. They use reindeer for food. They use reindeer for transportation. Reindeer is used for clothing. It's fully embedded within their society. And these rain on snow events, which appear to be coming now more common, uh, is having very, very strong impacts. There's certain things you can do. For example, one can bring in supplemental feeding, things like that. But that costs a lot. Uh, you can move reindeer to better pastures, but that can take a long time. It can put stress on the reindeer. So there are a number of strategies that can be followed, but there's only so much that can be done. Uh, of course, uh, this is just another example. This is just showing a, uh, you know, part of a winter camp here. From These are from uh, the next communities uh, up north. We're a part of a large project through National Science Foundation trying to study this sort of thing. So I'm showing a, a bit from, from that study. Uh, now, you know, how common are these things? Um, this is actually a challenge. We think they're becoming more common, uh, but how common are they now? There's ways that you can use remote sensing to get at that, uh, using uh, passive microwave remote sensing, active remote sensing, uh, a number of different ways. Uh, this was uh, from our colleague, uh, Annette Barsh, uh, who was just doing an analysis over about a 10 year period, trying to look at how frequent these are. And the oranges is where they're more frequent, blues is where they're less frequent. But it's actually a tough nut to crack uh, because some of these events are well reported because of their impacts. Others are not because you can't really, unless you could, you know, automatically sort of identify these sorts of things. Uh, and so part of the project we've got, for example, is that we are working with reindeer herders and others to try and better understand these features and their frequency. Um, we uh, Another way to look at these sorts of things is through actual observer networks. Uh, this is from what they call the LEO network. Uh, and this is operated out of, uh, out of Alaska. Uh, but these are things like reports from media and things like this. Here you see one here, 300 reindeer found dead uh, in Kamchatka. That was actually a very small event uh, in terms of reindeer mortality. 
what are these things associated with? Well, we, uh, in terms of the meteorology of these things, we know that they're associated with what we call blocking events in the atmosphere. These are situations where the atmosphere gets in a certain configuration and things don't want to move around much or shift around much. Uh, something like this, anyone here's a meteorology, and here's what you call the top left, a classic omega block. And these are often associated with these sorts of events. But what's very important, apparently, for a lot of these events is what we call atmospheric rivers. Uh, these are narrow bands of very high concentrations of water vapor. You see it in the green there, that sinuous feature going all the way to Svalbard. There's been a number of events on Svalbard, one in particular in 2012, which was the largest precipitation event ever, uh, caused a large mortality of, of tagged reindeer, slush avalanches, causing buildings uh, uh, to be damaged. It actually worm, warmed permafrost down to several meters because of the latent heat release uh, when, the, uh, when that rain uh, froze. So it's, this is the growing impact. So we talk a lot about glaciers, things like that, ice sheets, but we have to remember that so many of the people on the front line are those residents in the Arctic who are seeing these effects very much right now, and they're getting worse. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much, Mark. Our last speaker on this event is Lexi Huskins from uh, the Arctic Angels. Hello, so I'm Lexi and I am not going to have any slides, but just give a little bit of a little breather of a perspective of how sea level rise and how the Arctic is impacting me in a land, like a landlocked country of Colorado. So I am from Denver and basically in Denver, we are very far from the sea, but as long as um, we have the sea level rise is impacting those around us because we are having climate refugees that are in flooding away from the coast and coming inland. And it's well as um, impacting those with the, uh, sorry. <laughs> getting around oh okay going back to it um so essentially water is extremely important to us in colorado it is gold and we don't have that much of it because we rely on the snowmelt and snowmelt is regulated by the jet stream and the ocean currents and when the sea ice is melting the ocean currents and the jet stream are being impacted and with these droughts comes fires comes mudslides comes floods and i have experienced all these things with seeing floods in 2013 the big thompson river went through the canyon and it was 20 feet high so seven meters and it wiped out all these all everybody's homes and there was really literally nothing left in this uh in the uh canyon so we had to think about um sea level rise oh shoot I'm sorry, pardon me. Uh, so in the Rockies, basically, we rely on this water to help with the um, impacts on both the socio and economic standpoint. So we rely on the water for drinking, for agriculture, and for ski and tourism. And our ski industry is $4.8 billion annually. And if we don't have this water and what is the Rocky Mountains without the snow? And I don't know if anybody, there are some people from Colorado here, I'm pretty sure, but not everybody is here. And without the snowpack, we are losing a lot, both in jobs and in, um, in, like, in tourism and what we are seeing. And beyond that, with the fires, we are seeing that 20 out of 20 of the largest fires in the past 20 years, all these 20s have been happening in Colorado. And of the very last year, so in 2020, we had the largest fire. It was 325 miles squared, which is 150,000 football fields, which is a giant amount. And luckily last year, we did not have as big of fires, but this is only because there was nothing to burn. And we experienced the fires from Idaho and California and Oregon, they were all of that pollution was coming into our town. And for three months in Colorado, where it is sunny and we have blue skies all the time, we did not have blue skies. We had air pollution. We couldn't breathe. It was terrible. People were getting sick. People were losing lives. And we know like 
fires are being experienced everywhere, not ev and um, so is droughts, but it's just, just a little bit of a perspective coming from a landlocked country where sea level rise is not immediately seen, but we are experiencing extreme events that are impacted from the sea level rising and changing the atmospheric and ocean currents. So, thank you. So thank you so much to all of our speakers. I don't know if someone uh, would like to ask or have some questions online as well. Okay, so I don't know. Any questions here? No? Okay, great. So thank you so much. Please uh, join us at 1 p.m. We will have great presentations on Antarctica and Paris goals, risks of massive sea level rise. Thank you so much for joining us today. <laughs>